How do you build the muscle of recognizing and following your desire? Wow, that has become the center point for me in my life. Because what else is there really? What else is there? Hello everyone. It's Christine Marie Mason, your host for the Rose Woman Podcast. Question for you. What is your relationship with learning? Do you have a curiosity that you're hungry to sate? Do you want to learn new things and yet find yourself hanging back? Do you crave to be able to do something physically and then find yourself saying, it's not for me, it's I'm too old, I'm too this, don't have the time, why should I even bother? I have a friend in Chicago and she and I met when the children were very young and she at that point wanted to be an artist and she tried to go to art school but it was just too much she couldn't manage the kids and manage the household and do that so it didn't happen but when they got to a certain age she began painting for real and she did go to art school and then eventually she was making these gorgeous skyscapes full of paintings that were sold all over and hanging in hotels and every time I could get my hands on one I would they're stunning and then she said you know I I think this phase of my life is over and I find myself called to food policy like it really matters to me that we have good clean food and that it's labeled well and that nourishment is uh, available for people of all economic categories and I think I'm going to be a lawyer and go study food law and she started law school at 50. So I say this because her persistence and tenacity, which extended to other things as well, like learning instruments or uh, learning Kabbalah and other things in her life, like just a, a quality of devotion and curiosity and not accepting no, not accepting limits. I think this time of life in midlife is very much about coming into our wisest self and knowing what is ours to do. And at this point, maybe evaluating what has happened and where our inner longing is yet unmet and what the world needs and finding a new path. So this week, I have a guest who's going to speak about that from a very personal perspective, Lisa betz about becoming embodied and finding embodied joy in some of the changes of midlife. And then next week, I was so lucky to be able to interview uh, the wonderful Chip Conley, the founder of Joie de Vivre Hotels, senior advisor to Airbnb for many years, and now the founder of Modern Elder Academy. So I hope you listen to both episodes. If you find yourself in a place where you're evaluating what is mine to do now and are looking for tools to navigate that. So without further ado, please welcome Lisa betz I am so happy today to have my friend Lisa betz back on the show. She was one of the very first ambassadors for Rosebud, and she did a whole bunch of video interviews for us a couple of years ago before the podcast even got going. And she's just such a wonderful, vibrant, and alive person. Because we're doing this series on embodied joy, she was one of the first people who came to mind because of a story I remember her telling about starting to ballroom dance in midlife. And when I say to ballroom dance in midlife, I'm talking spangly dresses, big spins, deep dips. I mean, very extravagant and very poised and very beautiful. But in the meantime, in addition to that, she's been doing a lot of other things. She coaches and helps women find their voice and find their own joy. And I think we're going to start today by talking about an idea of the embodied crone, Mm. which is a crazy, (laughs) wonderful phrase. I totally resonate with that. And uh, it's new to me. So can you let me know? What what is that? Well, as you said, I have gone on a journey of moving from being a homeschooling parent and in service to my communities for over a decade into rediscovering my own joy as a performer and starting to dance when I was 49. And then 
speaking about the experience of rebranding aging and telling new stories, reclaiming what it means to be my age, my age right now, I'm 57, and I am intent on and committed to changing the narrative on how we age in our culture. And through this journey, I've always been looking at the the monikers, right? What do we call ourselves? And crone is always the thing. We have that typical maiden mother crone archetypes that I always felt something was missing. And you know what, Christine, some of this thinking was inspired by you at an event we both spoke at probably, I don't even know how long ago it was. It was maybe it was 15, I don't know, somewhere between 10, 10 and 15 years. And because this is an ongoing conversation that we both obviously care a lot about what the experience is for women um, of our generation. And in this conversation, we were both referencing the fact that medical science has changed how much time we have to live. And we now have a period of time from 50 to who knows when, 70, 80, 90, more and more people think we're going to live to be 100. And so when you look at that spectrum or that transition of maiden mother crone, you start to realize pretty quickly that there are a lot of years all stacked into the crone years. Most women go through menopause sometime between their late 40s and their early 50s. And if we're going to live into our 80s, 90s, or even 100, that's half of our life in this stage of time that has been identified by black robes. And yes, wisdom, it's it, it through wisdom our way. Yeah, you're, you're old and wise. But a physiology, uh, a representation that has been covering the body, bony, disembodied. It was like a disembodied experience. And I've been thinking ever since I started on this idea of rebranding aging, what, what do we call ourselves? And there are a lot of people I know who are reclaiming crone and re-owning it and re-envisioning the idea of crone. And I'm open to that. But if we're going to use the moniker of crone, it has to be an embodied crone, an erotic crone, a sexual crone, a physically vibrant crone. There has to be an element of embodiment in it. So that's one option. The other option is that we create some entirely new categories. And for me, the idea of the erotic high priestess is something that I see as being in between mother and crone for the period of time that I'm in right now, where I don't feel like I'm as wise as I'm going to be yet. And I certainly don't feel like I'm as close to the end stages as I might be when I'm in my 70s or 80s. Right now, this stage of life in my 50s, and I think for many women, they're able to carry this deeply into their 60s, where we are free of the responsibilities that we've had as mothers. We ha are so much more available and committed to and dedicated to our own sovereignty we are not asking for people's permission, but we have freedom in the sense of physical vibrancy and health. We have access to resources. We built deep communities. This is a very different stage than what the crone represents. So for me right now, I'm using erotic high priestess. <laughs> I've been talking about that period as the free period. You're free of obligations and also still pretty free in your body. I think Eros as a whole gets sexualized, but Eros is actually a much broader idea. It's related to the quality and the intensity and the awareness and the joy with which you live. When I think about these years, I'm more conscious of knowing that there's a time limit than I was 20 years ago. And like, I really have no tolerance for grievance, for the pessimism, for the blaming, the shaming, trying to make it other people's fault. Like at this point, seize your life. Your joy is your responsibility. Whether you're active to change and make a dent in the world is up to you. And if you are, then go for that. But there's no more space for a fear-based life. So I think this erotic crone seems to have the potential to be right in line with that. So how, how does it show up for you, this eros and and this erotic priestess concept, how does it show up and, and manifest? Well, first of all, I want to acknowledge and appreciate and embrace your widening the idea of eros in that language, because you're right, we tend to sexualize the idea of the erotic and eros has so much more 
layers and so much more subtlety. And I think that that is one of the things that as women of our age, or at least it's been my experience, that as I reclaim sexuality and my embodiment and love, and love, as you're saying, broadening out love as a whole recognition of the that's what I, what I took from what you're saying and from some other things that I, I know you've talked about which is not only do we have responsibility and no need to blame or shame or make anybody wrong but part of embracing our lives is embracing the wholeness of it and loving the wholeness of it for me what I experience at this stage in my life is all these pieces come together so I recognize my own sovereignty my own responsibility but as an opportunity as a foundation for being able to give in a different way than I could when I was raising kids or when I was younger. I feel I have so much more capacity for part of what I contribute being love in the larger. And in order for that to be the foundation, what I've experienced myself is I've had to reclaim some aspects of my embodiment. And it's true, I started that journey by dancing. And it's also true that that journey of dancing was very feminized in a very sort of Latin dance kind of way with the nails and the sparkles and the dresses, and you referenced that already. And that was a fantastic reclamation for me of going from being a homeschooling parent who never wore jewelry or makeup or did my hair or anything to trying on all those, all those, you know, that, that kind of iconic feminized idea of the Latin, the sexy Latin dancer. And it was, it was fantastic. I loved it. I still, I still love it. And I think what's happened since then, as I've gone deeper into what does it really mean to re-embody the feminine? Part of that has been a deeper aspect of eroticism and sexuality that encompasses all the other stuff that we're talking about. Yeah, I, I think there's a picture. You showed me a picture of you before you were dancing. And I wanted to see if you, can you remember the moment when you decided to do it? To dance? Yeah, and were you like, were you afraid? Were you doubtful? Did you have an objective? Did you know you would end up going sort of semi-pro or pro? Say there's somebody out there who's listening and they're for, in their late 40s and they've been a mom and they're, and they're thinking, why would I dance? That's for young girls, you know? What, what would you tell them about your own experience and how you navigated to just doing it? Yeah, I can tell, tell the story of how that happened. Essentially, I was, my kids were getting to be teenagers and I was experiencing having been 15, 10, 15 years as a homeschooling parent, which was very involved and done attachment parenting, very involved with my kids' lives. And I didn't want to be that mother who was holding on to them. And I could feel that in myself. I was so in involved with their lives and I knew I needed to find something else. And at the time I was singing in a homeschooling mom's band and I'd previously been a film and television actor, but in my head, I put that in the past. It, to me, that was, has been film and television actor. And I, I never spoke about it, actually. I don't think people mostly knew that that had been my, my first career. And even though I did over a hundred episodes of nighttime drama and movies of the week and feature films and but I just didn't talk about it because I thought that was what I used to be now I'm a homeschooling mom and but as my kids got older and I knew I had to find something else I found myself one day walking in front of a ballroom dance studio in my neighborhood and I had what I call a shall we dance moment which I don't know if you ever saw the film there's a Japanese version and American version where the main character is riding home from his job as an accountant and he looks down in the train and he looks through a window and sees Jennifer Lopez dancing the tango or something like that. And his mouth drops. And I had a moment like that. I'm walking by a dance studio and my jaw dropped because I saw these two 14, 15 year old dancers dancing. What I found out was Latin ballroom dance. And I thought, whatever that is, I need to do that. That looks so fun. So I walked into the dance studio and I asked them about their classes. And they ended up selling me a card of 10 lessons. And one of the stories I tell in my rebranding aging talk is the fact that I did not use any of the I never I didn't go to those classes. Because there was a part of my brain that said, you can't do a dance form like that. They start when they're five. And then by the time they're 14, they're incredible. It's super sexy. It's extremely athletic. It takes a lot. I thought you can't do that. But somehow the card of 10 was going to expire. And I was raised by a mother who was very cautious about money. And so I was like, you cannot waste this card. So I went in and I took a lesson. I totally fell in love. I started competing 
three months later and I competed a lot. The first three years I was dancing Latin, it's actually called American Rhythm, the American style of the Latin dances. I think I, da- I did 30 competitions. And I'm just to clarify, I'm, I was never pro. I danced pro-am, which means I was a, I was a very competitive amateur dancer for my age. And yeah, and at one point, you know, I tell the story of winning a champion world championship in my age category, but that's not really the point of it. The point of it is that I knew I wanted to dance. I love dancing. And there was a lot stopping me from doing it. A lot of the stories. The, and the stories are, you're too old and it's too late. And how many times do we tell ourselves that? How many times do people think, I can't go back to school? Which, of course, you've set, been an example for dispelling that <laughs> multiple times, I think. <laughs> but so many people think, well, I can't do that. I can't go back to school now. It's too late. Or I can't start a new career. It's too late. Or I can't start this hobby that is for kids. Or, you know, the other one that I did is I got on TikTok a couple of years ago. It's like, you can't get on TikTok. It's for teenagers. Well, maybe your ne- maybe your big book is going to be you're not too old and it's not too late. Yeah. I mean, I have only had that thought a couple of times and and usually it's related to something athletic. You know, like what if my body won't respond? But you did. What was the plasticity of your of your body and your joints and your response times and what did you learn about that? How did you prepare for that? What I learned from that is well, first of all, I I'll never be a dancer like the people that start when they're young. I'll I'll never be that. And that's fine. I think the thing that I learned from it was that you start where you are and the love of the thing matters more than where you're at in terms of skill level or what your body's like. It's the love of the thing. And I was so in love with it and I was so passionate about it that I spent so many nights when I couldn't be at the dance studio going over my routines in my head because I couldn't get up. I was like trying to like, I was obsessed. I was a little bit obsessed. And a year later, my body was completely different. I think I, lo- I lost a ton of weight, but it wasn't because I was trying to lose weight. In fact, it's probably the only time I've ever actually lost like a fair bit of weight was because I was so passionate about what I was doing and all the rest didn't really matter. So I just have to like bring this to a pause and to amplify this component of the message. Did you hear this? You didn't do it, even if you were never going to be good, you did it because you loved it. And I just want to bring that home, like the following of your desire and the following of your joy rippled out into all of this other healthful benefits and this kind of slight obsession and all of that stuff. But following your desire and following your joy, let's just expand on that a little bit. That pulse, have have you found that in other areas? like? How do you build the muscle of recognizing and following your desire? Wow, that has become the center point for me in my life. And maybe it started there. I love that you're presencing it for me and for anyone who's listening. Because what else is there really? What else is there? What else is there? Duty, to-do list, responsibilities, chores. Worrying about what other people think. Right. I mean, I mean, really, what else is there? Like, those are the things that we get fooled into. But those things don't take, yeah, they don't take us to the place that we want to be. And I, and there is something about the freedom of, for me, I experience at this stage of my life where I really feel freedom from those things. I don't really care about those things. And yes, they can pull on us. But when it comes right down to it, I notice that if I trust myself and I do what I want to do, all the things that need to get done, get done. But it's the lack of trusting that you're actually a good person and you're going to do the right thing, you're going to contribute, that your small moves make a difference. And I'll give you an example of that for related to the dance story. There was a part of me when I was in my first couple of years of dancing. Now, I don't know if you experienced this. It's extremely common. When you have videos of yourself dancing, it doesn't matter what level of you are. It's hard to watch them. All you do is see the mistakes. And I knew I was an amateur dancer and I knew I was a beginner dancer and I knew I started dancing when I was 49. So I'd look at my dance videos and I think, oh my God, I can't show this to anybody. But I'd put them occasionally out. I would put them on Facebook and I would do it a little with a bit of a cringe, a bit of a like, Ugh, totally sheepish. I can't even believe I'm putting this out there. People are who do they, they're going to say, who do you think you are? You're posting some dance video. You're a beginner who's like 50 or whatever. But what happened is people started telling me, oh my gosh, I saw your dance. It's so inspiring. 
like lots of people that I knew. I only posted on Facebook, so it was just friends. And I kept hearing that. And so what I realized is that me following what I love, and even though sheepishly putting it out there, thinking it really wasn't worth being seen, made a difference in other people's lives. And in fact, one of my friends told me that she took up horseback riding after years of wanting to because she saw me take up dancing after raising my kids and being in my 50s. And she's told me that a couple of times that I, because of that story, she took up horseback riding, which she is now passionately in love with and competitive. Yeah, you following your joy inspires others to follow theirs. And so in that way also, it's like, oh my, sometimes one of the complaints I hear for people who are duty bound by tradition and family systems is that it would be too selfish. And when you see what actually happens is it's contagious in a very positive way. Uh, similarly, I, I have a friend who took up surfing in her 50s, and it was something that she always wanted to do, but she had the same objection that it was, you know, kids in Hawaii start surfing at four, and how is she ever going to be good? And this idea of being good was getting in the way of trying anything at all until she finally said, but I like it. I like it. I'm going to show up every day because I like it. Nothing else. They'll not, and being willing to sort of be laughed at, which was her fear, which no one did. You know, no one's laughing at you when you're trying something new. Uh, there's a young woman in my friend circle, Antonina Moon. Have you ever met her? I think I've heard the name from you, but I don't, I don't think I've met her. She's a Russian immigrant who was a basketball player in Russia, but she's petite, which is, so she's nimble. And I can remember she would, she started painting. And she put up her paintings and she'd be like, look, I'm painting, I'm, I'm riding horses, I'm roller skating backwards, I'm, I'm learning how to be a ballerina. And, and, you know, initially her enthusiasm and exuberance like kind of rubbed me the wrong way. Like, how can she think that she can just do all of this stuff? But then like I would, but I was strangely attracted to her. Like I always, I was always tuning in and I finally realized like, she was so innocent and so authentic and pursuing all of these things for the sheer joy of it that I started catching it from her. So yes, I think you're the same way. You're, you're like a contagion in a positive contagion. So, okay, where were we? We were talking about the following the pulse of your desire and being able to recognize it. And you slipped in a little something when you said, oh, I really don't worry about those things anymore. The important stuff takes care of itself. Was that a side effect or did you have practices around that? Okay, hold on a second. Let me think about that for one second because I said it in a flip way. But it's not flip, it's profound. And it's not flip, it's not flip. So I'm gonna talk out loud here for a second. This is what I call in my speaking skills training, feminine speaking practice. It honors the way that we speak as women where we don't really know what we're saying, but we speak and think out loud <laughs> to figure out what it is. So I'm gonna do that for a second. What I What comes to my mind is that there is something to this stage of life for me that has thrown me into that, that has made it come more easily. It's almost like it pulled me into you don't care, that in some ways makes it feel a little more effortless. It, it's like there's a certain stage when something flips in your brain where you realize, like you said, I only have who knows how much more time to live and so much more choice in, in what I what I do in, in with all my time. I'm going to make the most of it. And some of that is by virtue of being the stage. And we also come right up against the many limitations of our culture's stories about what is appropriate for us. So well, it's kind of like the flip side of what you said earlier. On the one hand, there's no point in paying any attention to, to anything other than than what's true for us. But at the same time, the reality is, like I think you, what, what I'm talking about is when you said that there's no time for dealing with the blame or the, the shame or any of the stories, but the reality is we, have, we face the stories. As women in our 50s, we face stories. So while I agree with you and I never want to fall victim to somebody else's stories and limitations for me, they're there and I think it's most powerful when we recognize, oh, and there is this narrative and I'm gonna create an alternative to it. So that's a bit of a convoluted way. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it's mostly in, in that I was facing my own stories, you know, and some of those are culturally informed. One thing that I don't really enjoy is I kind of look younger than my age. And 
there's this sort of astonishment from people in their authorities, like you're how old or your grandmother or you're what? And, and then I feel them like changing their perspective on me, like doing the recalculation in their mind. And I kind of like, oh, I wish I hadn't told you that, you know, there's a piece of me because I want to be taken at face value and I can see the judgment that someone else is bringing. And then they think you're like an exception for your age versus like, this is just actually the reality of it. So you should lose your stereotypes. Totally. I mean, I think I'm not aware of what you described in terms of people recalibrating, but I know many women who tell me they experience that, especially, for example, dancers who don't want to say their age because they'll be perceived differently. They they don't seem their age. They don't look their age. They don't dance their age. And they don't want to say their age because they don't want that bias to get involved. And I don't know if I've experienced that. Maybe I have. I'm not a, so aware of it. But the other piece I'm very aware of, and that is the need for us to recalibrate people's idea about what age looks like. And that's a journey in and of itself. I mean, I, like for me having white hair, right? That's been a process for me to explore. What does it mean to have white hair? And I both, I like my hair white, but I also know it to be true that if I dyed my hair, I would be perceived as a, probably five to 10 years younger than I am. But we have these associations. We have these many, many associations that says if you have white hair, then it automatically adds years to you. And so I know a lot of women who don't want to stop dyeing their hair, even if they might want to stop dyeing their hair, because they don't want that extra 10 year perception on them. Because I'm in a community of people who support each other in not dyeing their hair, because we, the truth is that we need support because sometimes, especially before COVID, a lot of people felt alone in that choice. Post COVID, it's become a lot more common. But there are groups of women who support each other in that because it is outside the box of our culture of our culture's expectations. But that doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with any choices that anyone else makes. For me, it's all about personal choice and freedom, not about one way of being is the right or the wrong way. And I'm so curious to hear what you think about this, because I'm going to guess that in your line of business, it comes up when you're serving and your clients are you have clients who are my age and older. And I'm really curious about how you hold this idea of beauty and self-care. Like, I guess what I'd share is one of the things that comes up a lot around this idea of reclaiming and making the most of optimizing our bodies and ourselves from a point of view of health, but also from aesthetics, choosing to do beautiful things and wear beautiful clothes or take care of our skin or, you know, use products that help us stay vibrant there's a tension between doing those things and accepting aging. And I don't think they're mutually exclusive, but I think a lot of times they're pitted against each other. I'm going to do what you did and do the, the sort of out loud thinking. Yeah. I'm sort of exhausted by 40 years of trying to be beautiful. And when I went on my European tour to do the book tour and to teach classes and do all the stuff I did in Europe this summer, I landed in Italy and they lost my luggage for five days. And I had a choice. Was I gonna go and buy all new toiletries and mascara and foundation and soap and blah, 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 hyaluronic acid. And I mean, come on, it would have been like a thousand dollar shop. And I just decided not to. And I was running around getting tan and drinking water and splashing my face with water and not even using soap. About four or five days in, I was like, I feel great. And then I started, it started to like unravel something that I already knew, which was I was exhausted from the effort. And as much as I want to be like, I just want to be beautiful and accepted the way I am. So now if I go out and I put on lipstick or I, you know, get a blowout or whatever, it's like for fun and frill. It's not to cover up things that I'm ashamed of or that aren't adequate. And I don't think that has to do with aging because for objectively, my skin was better 20 years ago, but I still didn't feel pretty. And I felt, I feel very pretty right now for no reason other than I'm just liking myself, you know, and, and also, I can remember my grandmother at 80 something being like, 
I have so many wrinkles. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, you're 80. I, I, I was like a teenager. I'm going, of course you do. You're 80. What's your fucking problem? <laughs> you know, stop complaining about them. Like, and, uh, and I was doing a medicine journey. And she came to me in the fullness of her 40-year-old, gorgeous, radiant, made-up, Jackie O. Glasses self. And she said, listen, about your resentments, if you don't let go of them now, you're going to end up just like me. And she was not a happy older person. And so this sort of holding on to things and resenting aging and resenting your life and resenting the things that you didn't accomplish really got cemented, like releasing those resentments and letting go of those things is a critical aspect of being happy in midlife and beyond probably younger too but they don't accumulate as fast when you you know they just stack on themselves there's just not as many um, anyway so energetic hygiene and has become more important than physical grooming that's a long that, answer no i love and that that's <laughs> that is no that is exactly the question that i'm asking and exactly the answer that i think needs to be underlined which is that when anything we do is because we feel we're not enough or too much of something because we have shame or judgment of ourselves because we're trying to fix ourselves, make ourselves better, more attractive or more appealing to somebody else. It doesn't matter what we do or don't do. There's an essential challenge with that. And I think by the same token or the corollary is that we can also choose to adorn ourselves and take care of our bodies in ways or to wear makeup or do anything to ourselves as a form of self-expression, creativity, and joy. And I think the underlying piece is the thing that matters rather than the, the form it takes. Yeah, for me, that's costuming right now. Right. Like I'm wearing ridiculous things. Like what? Well, like I went out clubbing in Ibiza. In, in Berlin? In Berlin? <laughs> no, in Ibiza. In Ibiza. Oh, Ibiza. Okay. And I wore um, bright silk, yellow and white striped pajama pants with floral trim and a uh, tank top with a racer back and big cuff jewelry and my hair in a ponytail up on the top and rainbow tennis shoes. And I had the best time. I was totally sweaty and, and, you know, happy and just crazy radiant feeling. Another time I bought a dirndl, like one of those Swiss Miss kind of outfits. And I, and I did the long braids and I just went out that way in tennis shoes. (laughs) Okay. So like, I'm definitely getting in wacky granny mode but it's creating so much joy for me to just be, you know, colorful and expressive and not cool anymore. I just don't want to be cool. So that brings up something that I think ties this piece together that is super important to me, which is this idea of beauty diversity. We have been raised in a culture that has a 1% rule about who gets to identify who's identified as beautiful or uh you know a particular type of style or look or coloring or skin type or you know it's so limited that we've been we've been conditioned and been brainwashed to believe that the word beauty is only applicable to a certain type of person a certain look of person and the truth is that as human beings We can expand our idea of what it means so that maybe it's that Swiss miss with the tennis shoes or the, you know, the who knows whatever other outrageous archetypes you decide to play in that are beauty, that are part of your beauty. I mean, trees don't decide, oh, it's only the tall, skinny birch tree that's beautiful and the old craggy oak is ugly. We don't think of trees like that. So why do we think of our human incarnations like that? Well, actually, it's interesting time to be experimenting because I didn't experiment when I was younger. I really wanted to be elegant and that got pretty boring. (laughs) (laughs) Like I had the elegance police. In your own head? Yeah. The elegance police would follow me around and they'd look for a thread count. uh, (laughs) Solid colors, mostly muted. Oh, wow. Awesome. So so we're on the theme of finding joy in the body and saying yes to true desire. So let's let's go back to this erotic priestess idea. I still want to hear about that. It's a perfect segue because it's about exploring archetypes. And you just talked about some and you're calling it costuming. I'd call what you described as deepening into and expanding the range of access I have to all the 
archetypes that live in me as a person, as a human, as a woman. And I also personally wouldn't use the word costuming because, not that there's anything wrong with you doing, but a way that this integrates into my thinking is that all of the ways we expand our range by exploring archetypes are things that actually are us. They're in us. They're not they're not putting something else on. And a lot of times when I talk about act, my acting background, people say, well, I'm so interested. You're so, in, uh, it's so, so surprising that you're into authenticity and to being real and to being deep. Well, that is my experience of what acting is. Acting is going in and finding the parts of yourself that you don't have as much access to and expanding them and drawing them out of you and continuously getting more ability to use those parts of you. It's not about putting on a fake thing. So I think of exploring archetypes in the same way. I'm exploring an archetype that already exists in me. And a lot of this has come through my training in the John Wineland teacher training program with the masculine, feminine, sexual polarity and intimacy work that I've been doing, which is looking at the places where I don't have as much access. And there was a connection to what you just asked me. Let me think what it was. Oh, yeah. So going back to the embodied crone piece, that's just one archetype that I'm looking at expanding for myself in my life right now because the embodied crone or the erotic high priestess the erotic high priestess was me putting together some ideas that i feel are i'm imbued with like a lot of times people say oh you have so much you're wise we're really happy to have your ancient wisdom here i'm like yeah and you know because i'm mostly i spend a lot of time with people who are quite a bit younger than me <laughs> I'm like And there's something in that that's taking away or not acknowledging these other parts of myself that in terms of, say, in this world of the sensual, I feel so much more tuned into what pleasure is and what sensuality is and what my own experience of being in a sexual and sensual and erotic feminine body is than I did when I was younger. And... I think there's a lot to be taught from that place, Uh, you know, especially because we live in a world where women are so conditioned on being performative, not just in how they look, right? Not just in what they look like or they've got the right thread count or they got the right lipstick on or the makeup or if they've done their lips or whatever, but how they experience pleasure and sexuality has been fed to us as looking a certain way that is very much through the male gaze, And so for me, the erotic high priestess is the part, the archetype, the part of me that knows better, that knows there's something deeper than this image of what sexual looks like in a woman's body that our culture feeds to us. I want to build on the inner knowing piece. I remember walking into a party or like a gathering, not really a party. And there was a man there and he was my age, maybe a little older very shiny, very bright eyes. And he was so still in himself, so calm and so open. And he was just looking at me and holding my gaze. And I held his gaze and I felt this in my energy field. Like we just dropped in immediately. It was such a pull. And the pull had almost nothing to do with the physical appearance of him or of me but the energetic body and the energetic awareness from all of the training that I've done and yoga and meditation and him and Tai Chi and Kundalini, which I learned later, was like our energy bodies are entering into communion and there's so much more going on and all you have are eyes. You're just beautiful, beautiful eyes shining out from whatever this body has done. And uh, it was, one of the most profound intimate connections I've ever had and our clothes stayed on. And so there's this also the awareness of like, it's not even about the body or the appearance. It's something else is happening. They used to call it pheromones, but it's, it's definitely at the energetic level and playing with energy is the most fun sexual play I've had. 100%. And I don't know that all the noise of my life, at least when I was younger, had any space for that. And so recognizing and entering into that world of the energetic connection and energetic intimacy is 
for sure amazing, incredible, huge opportunity. So much of what I associate to the erotic high priestess archetype. We can try our different kinds of expression. We don't have to accept that the archetype that we're going to step into is the uh, emphasizes the crone aspect. We can say, no, it's much broader. We're stepping into erotic priestess as one model. And then what are some exercises or things that if someone wants to sort of practice that in their own life that you would recommend? I like journaling a lot. And specifically, I find it to be really powerful when I write down what the thought structures are that I'm living out of. And then simply create alternatives for those thought structures. Because the truth is, we get to, we're meaning making machines, right? We get to assign any meaning we want to a circumstance. So if I recognize a circumstance that I don't like, I like to ask myself, what's the meaning that I would make of that? Can you give me an example? Yeah, yeah, I, I can, this is a little bit of a convoluted example, but it's the one that comes to mind because it's the most relevant for me. Uh, and that is that I've recently been dealing with a lot of hypochondria Um, My mother died of pancreatic cancer very quickly, and it brought up a lot of fear of dying in my body and certainty that I have this wrong with me and I have that wrong with me and I have this disease and I have that disease. And some of it felt very real and COVID too. I would just have this belief system, this hypochondriacal belief system that I had something that I was going to die of. I feel like through COVID and also through this experience of recent hypochondria in my life, I have been facing the idea of dying pretty intensely. And the thought patterns that I had were, what am I going to tell my kids? What am I going to do? I don't have my, this is me believing that I have something wrong with me, which as far as I know, I do not. But in the moment, it felt real. And I was deep in this feeling of all the things that that was wrong. How could that be? All of the, this can't be, this is terrible, this is horrible. And at one point, something shifted in my brain. I was in the shower and something shifted. And I thought, you know what? If I am going to find out tomorrow that I'm going to die two weeks from now, what's the most art I can make out of that experience? And, and there was a part of me that said, Lisa, if that happens to you, you always take the things that happen to you and create some new meaning out of it. You always find the ways that there's some learning to be had or some different thing. That's, you, you know how to do that. And that was a big shift for me when I realized that no matter what circumstances I'm thrown, I'm willing to take on the challenge of how do I make that a creative practice and a creative piece of living art. And something in that shifted for me. So I don't know if that was a very good example because it was a little bit more involved, but. (laughs) How do I make the most art out of this is a great foundational question. Yeah, which you do all the time. That's how I feel that's how you live your life. You make art out of everything. You're making books, you're making stories, you're making businesses. I don't know. Maybe you don't. I'm curious because you might have that perspective on yourself since when we're in our own lives, we don't see it. But do you not do you not experience your own life like that? I wish that I could split myself like that Patanjali into 10,000 people and make all the things. Right. I know that one, too. I remember like a couple <laughs> of years ago, I, I did a I patented a care drone. <laughs> I was like trying to design this drone and you know, while I was doing Rosebud and teaching yoga, I don't know, it was crazy. So sometimes I think it's actually like a little bit of uh, mental, what did they call it now? Neurodivergence. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but the creativity piece, like I feel like the co-creation, the creative impulses in the seed of our DNA and that not creating, not having cons is, is a, a suppression layer, you know? That and that actually, you mentioned the dying thing. I've told this story before on the podcast about having an NDE like five years ago now, maybe four years ago, four and a half years ago. Everything changed, you know, because it was really like, you know, what death is cool, there's nothing out there to be afraid of, it's really beautiful. And also, like, you get to play in this body, and the only job is to play in this body is to just like get out and express yourself and try everything and like don't, you know, enjoy it, taste it all, and then reflect it back to others and to love them, to love your life. Loving your life is your whole job. And and it it was really a big release valve. So I think it's interesting that you're, that in, in the connection between finding your most joy, there comes a point when you really do have to confront this idea that it's not infinite, 
no, nobody's going to me- remember your misery. You know, what What a horrible, like, can you imagine being on your deathbed like, yeah, they really, they were really miserable. They really martyred it to the end. What example did you leave for anybody? So I, I will say in the first flush of post-child rearing, it felt a little bit like a mad off-gassing, like, like all the stuff that had stored up in me that hadn't gotten expressed was like, it's like, do this, try this, da, da, da. you know, like juggle a hundred balls and like, what else can I take on? And oh, I have so infinite energy. Oh, you mean, oh, sorry, you're talking about after you launched your kids. Got you, got you. Yes. Yes, yes, In the yes. period right after that, like the first four or five years was like, I'm going to travel the world and I'm going to paint paintings and I recorded an album and I was like, I just, like I did everything. And now I'm finding myself becoming more discerning because I do want the work that I do to have more impact in the long run. But, right. uh, but I wouldn't change anything about the off-gassing period. <laughs> you know how when you like unpack a mattress and it's been like tightly squeezed into the container and it takes a few days to fluff out until it's full shape? That's how it sort of felt. And then it's normal, then it's a normal mattress. So the first couple of years after raising a huge family was like, I was just like uncrimping. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, I think that takes to the larger theme that I feel in this conversation, which is, it's a simple one, but it's a pretty deep and profound one. And that is that there's such a tendency to make ourselves wrong. And, and you just said that the like there would could be a tendency that oh that's I'm too much this I'm not doing enough I'm not focused enough or and one or the other like we just gave two different examples of two different time periods and they're both perfect and right and like you said you wouldn't have wanted to change them because everything that we do if we follow our instincts serves a purpose even if we don't know what it is yeah I feel very trusting about that right now yeah that oh you know what like I'm having a a little bit of a post trip trough you know, I really ran hard. I think I did 15 days of presenting or teaching out of 12. I mean, out of 17. And, you know, a little bit of a trough uh, and then jet lag. There's a part that wants to override that and push. And then the other part that's, you know, if you just chill out, by the way, your creativity and your energy will be back in a couple of days. There's no need to push yourself. I've got enough experience to know that. So trusting, trusting the unfolding as long as you're staying conscious and aware, that's a big piece. I just, I love this theme of following the impulse, following the desire, following your joy. You mentioned being supported by a community of women, others who will see you in your fullness. I, I love that you're continuing to train, that you've started this program with John Wyland, John Wineland. I, you know, that there's, there's all of these pieces about continuing to grow and not pigeonholing yourself and then expressing it and sharing it coupled with your, your age and, 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 and changing how people think about it. I know you cover some of this in the rebranding aging talk. You cover some of it in, the, in, how, in how you help women express their own mission in life. So uh, I, I do wanna give you some time to talk about your work now before we wind down. Like you're doing consulting and helping people find their voice in different modalities. What are those now? Like you, I'm pretty creative and I like to do all the things, but the top level commitment that I have is changing the narrative on aging and supporting voice, visibility, wisdom, and wealth for women in their 40s, 50s, and 60s. That's my vision. And how that's taking form is I am partway through a book, halfway through a book called Artful Aging. It was originally called the embodied, it was originally called The Crone Needs New Clothes. But I like artful aging. Yeah, I think artful aging and it has four pillars, which includes a lot of what we've talked about. One is optimizing, making the most of all the things that we have been given, optimizing our physical, our mental, our emotional, making the best of it all. The second one is reinventing, which includes learning all the time, trying on new things, changing how we experience ourselves, reinventing ourselves always, always becoming new. The third one is rebranding, which is talking about it, sharing it so that it doesn't stop with us. So we're serving the larger community and we're changing the stories for future generations. And then the fourth one is what we've been talking about right now, which is that no matter how much you optimize and reinvent and rebrand the idea of aging, the bottom line is we face reality and we're all going to experience grief, loss, and eventually death, (laughs) aging and death. And so the fourth pillar is gracious acceptance. 
And so I'm working on that book. It's probably halfway done. That's one of the things that I'm um, spending my energy on. And then in terms of the work that I do with people right now, it's mostly speaking skills training. I work as a contract coach for a big company and corporations in the Fortune 500s. And then I have my own speaking training called Speak for Yourself. I do individual coaching and underneath the technical parts of the work, which are using film and television acting skills and stage skills to help people improve their speaking skills and their ability to present underneath it, underneath it, the real story is it's about empowerment and sovereignty and our voices. And so I love that work. I love the way that women, when they're confronted with finding their story and telling their story and they're supported in doing so, how cracked open they get, how it's a metaphor for all the ways that we do or don't take up space and live fully. Find your sparkle, live fully. And if you're having trouble with that, call Lisa. <laughs> so she'll set you straight. Maybe she'll put you in her sparkle dress and spin you around the floor. Or she'll get you to be an erotic priestess. Or I don't know, stand you up on a stage and say, tell me what you care about. Tell yeah. The, the, the interesting query for me right now is I don't know where this is going. I just stated it yesterday is I... I'm not going to be surprised. I'll put this in the marker here in this time recording for the first time. Who knows where it's going to go? But I'm not going to be surprised if some years down the road from now, I don't know if it's one or five or whatever, that I do more relationship and communication coaching, possibly with men or couples. Not going to be surprised if I head in that direction. But I don't know what it's going to look like. I just have this instinct. There's something about that brewing for me. I, I love that. And if you keep it in this age targeted range, mm -hmm. it's a really critical time because people are very puzzled. Yes. Their wives and their husbands are changing significantly. Yeah. It's like your, your values are gelling and the consciousness of the limited time uh, is a forcing function. And there are hard conversations to be had in this window. And who, who do you want to be in this way that you might not have been for the first 40 years? And are you really going to carry that bullshit story to your grave? Do we have to live like this for the next 20 years? Because if so, I'm not in. Yeah, you know, there's so much that could be unpacked on that, that piece around that particular age and how we relate to each other and all and using all the new understandings that we have, you know, new all the new instincts, the new awareness that maybe we didn't have 10 or 20 years ago, together and individually. Well, we'll put that marker down and we'll see where it goes. So are you inspired to try something new? To find your own embodied joy in midlife in a new way? I have so many things that I want to learn how to do. I'm just going to start. I'm going to start with my front walkover, back walkover intention. By the end of this calendar year, I swear to you, I'll be doing a front and back walkover again. Anyway, I really appreciate your time and your attention and your interest in the subject of how to optimize your well-being through all the stages of your life. The podcast is brought to you by Rosebud Woman, the company I founded to address intimate wellness concerns that women have, which has now expanded into body oils and other products that can just help make you feel fantastic. So come on over and check us out at rosewoman.com. And if you like this episode, please share it. Send it to a friend, text it to a friend, or recommend it online. And if you want to chat about it, you can find me on Instagram at the.rose.woman. May you enjoy the perfection of this one moment, the only moment there is. Mm -hmm.